So hello, today we have Evie with us, who's a second year medical student at Brighton and Sussex. Hello. Hello, thank you for having me. (laughs) No worries, thank you for spending some time today to chat about your kind of journey to medicine. Um, So if we start there, so yeah, what were you, what did you get up to before medicine? So um, yeah, I'm sure which is quite similar with a lot of grads, my Mm -hmm. journey has like lots of twists and turns in it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started medicine when I was 23 Mm -hmm. Uh, so after A levels I went and did a degree in biomedical sciences Mm -hmm. and then I was working for two years well kind of working I did a little Mm -hmm. bit of traveling and just general things Um, and the reason for that is that I basically applied for medicine during my A levels and then Mm -hmm. in the first year of uni and then the last year of uni Mm -hmm. got completely rejected every single time Mm -hmm. and then by that time I was like I think of education I'm going to do something completely different mm-hmm. um, which involved like the first six months of like doing the thing of like oh moving back to my parents and living at home mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. spending all of my money on a holiday that I couldn't really afford yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh working like bartending nannying working mm-hmm. at Asda and things like that um and then I landed this amazing job working for a not-for-profit organization so I did that Mm -hmm. for 18 months in total before Mm -hmm. then starting medicine Mm -hmm. yeah okay so quite a few different things um so medicine is something that has been kind of the plan for a while um and in your first year of uni would you were you hoping to kind of move across kind of would you have finished your like stopped your biomedical degree and then gone to medicine was that the plan in the first year or could you deferred like a couple of years um yeah basically that was the plan Mm -hmm. so when I was rejected I had applied to BSMS during my A-level years Mm -hmm. um got rejected but they'd sent a very nice letter that says here's a list of our courses pick one you'll get Mm -hmm. um an unconditional offer and if you meet your grades we'll give you three grand as well so I was like Mm -hmm. oh yeah Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds <laughs> good. Like consolation prize. So I did that, and then um, because it's, um, I went to the University of Sussex, so Brighton and Sussex Med School mm-hmm. is based joined the ancestry, and uh, so they're heavily linked. So in the medical first year, they have this scheme where you can. Um, if you apply to medicine you get guaranteed interview and you can kind of like just go across into the first year of medical school um, without having to finish your um, biomedical science degree so I did mm-hmm. try and do that um, didn't work uh, mm-hmm. I was terrible in the interview like absolutely terrible <laughs> mm-hmm. it didn't happen uh, so I carried on with my degree I did actually quite enjoy my degree in the end so mm-hmm. I'm really glad that it kind of worked out that way um, yeah yeah so how have you found your degree and kind of fitting in with medicine? Is there a lot you're bringing from it? Um, I think I think there is things that I'm bringing from it. I don't think much of the content, really. There are bits, like we're learning about ELISA's at the moment, mm-hmm. which I obviously covered quite extensively in my undergrad, so that's quite mm-hmm. handy. Um, but it's mainly more of the kind of like life experience bits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you know just being able to hold conversation like start conversations rather mm-hmm. um you know being able to organize my time and kind of mm-hmm. sort out what I need to prioritize so, so general things like that I think have definitely helped mm-hmm. more so than the actual content I think mm-hmm. I was hoping that quite a lot of the content would come in handy but sadly no <laughs> yeah I suppose biomedical science is so broad really like you could be covering you know a lot of content that yeah um so you were talking about the interview being kind of one of the challenges have you found that increase in confidence then really came through when you had subsequent interviews yeah yeah I would have been a disaster if I got into medical school when I was 18 because I was so um I was so shy and like Mm -hmm. antisocial and I just hated hated social situations like that Mm-hmm. any kind of pressurizing situation I just completely crumbled and mm-hmm. the interviews that I got so in the first year of my degree mm-hmm. um I think I think I had an interview 
when I applied in the last year of my degree as well. Um, so basically both times like, I completely floundered, you know, it, it just, I knew it was going to be bad because the night before I was, of course, everyone's nervous and anxious, mm. but I was like just physically sick from the amount of nervousness and anxiety that I had over it. Mm. Um, and then the last like UCAS round that I did where I did get offers was completely different because I was a lot more confident in myself mm. and um, I had a kind of shift in mentality where I was like, okay, this is an important day, but it doesn't define me. Like it's not gonna mm-hmm. define my self-worth is what I kept repeating to myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and it it did work. Like I was nervous, but it was controllable. And um, I kind of, I do this, I do the whole like fake it to you, make it. So I was like, what would you like, what would a confident Evie say in this situation? And how would she hold herself? And even just that like helped me process things a lot more in the actual interviews so Mm -hmm. definitely (laughs) yeah there's um I think it may have been a TED talk on like power poses before you go into things so you know like yeah like nice open structures maybe like a little like foot on a stool type thing um and then people doing that and then going in and it making a big difference so uh yeah maybe that's the maybe that's the trick (laughs) um Okay, so then an increase in confidence for interviews um, and that like really playing in. Um, so did you apply to the same med schools like, each time? Were you set kind of on the style of teaching you wanted and that sort of thing? Or um, did it vary across when you were applying? It did, it did vary quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't really remember all the ones that I applied for when I was in my mm-hmm. levels. Um, I know BSMS was on that. I think BSMS has been the one that I've consistently applied for mm-hmm. because I ended up going to University of Sussex. So it was like just mm-hmm. apply to the nearest one as well. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I actually can't remember. I think first year, I think I just applied to BSMS because they had that scheme going on. And I think it might have been the same for the last one, although I think I applied for a couple more. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the last application process, so the one where I actually got offered, I applied to three places. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is BSMS, Imperial and UCL mm-hmm. and uh, that's when I ended up getting offers for all three of them yeah. so I was quite chuffed yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah that's amazing like for medicine that's yeah that's really impressive um, and just going back thinking about kind of why med like what makes you want to do medicine in the sense of it's kind of known to be a very people role and like a lot of social interaction so if that was something that wasn't your favorite thing when you were younger like what made the drive for medicine um well right at the beginning the reason I wanted to do medicine was because mm-hmm. I wanted to be a forensic pathologist okay yeah okay. um so all the post-mortems and pilot mm-hmm. records, all that shenanigans so that's mm-hmm. primarily why I did it but I knew I wanted to do something very sciencey mm-hmm. um and so that so I kind of went into it for this kind of pathology stuff mm-hmm. but then as I was doing my degree which is very sciencey I was like mm-hmm. maybe this is a bit too much science mm-hmm. um and then afterwards like after education when I was working and things and I was mm-hmm. doing a lot of uh, people facing roles mm-hmm. and I realized that I really enjoyed that side so I needed something mm-hmm. that kind of had both and then it was like ah oh, medicine yeah what yeah um so it's worked out for the best but yeah I, I went into it wanting like a kind of the more anti-social side of like, mm-hmm. the science stuff but also mm-hmm. still human anatomy and stuff because I really loved that that subject mm-hmm. um and then ended up loving the people side of it too <laughs> yeah I suppose that is the beauty of medicine is it can cater for all sorts of interests you just have to get through the the med school bit and the foundation years before you can uh, yeah get away from people again <laughs> um and the so what can you tell me more about the not-for-profit like so after your university degree yeah absolutely I love talking mm-hmm. about it um yeah. so basically I did an internship with them mm-hmm. um they're a not-for-profit they're based in Brighton they're called the Brighton Ho Food Partnership mm-hmm. and they won't mind me talking about it because yeah. uh, I absolutely loved it there and they do they're the food partnership so it's all about food um mm-hmm. like educating people about food helping people that struggle to get hold of food mm-hmm. um so you know families on low incomes older people that might be more isolated and things like that 
So I started off with them working on a very small um, project at the time, um, which was basically a befriending service. So mm -hmm. matching people um, that felt isolated, uh, mm -hmm. who were maybe uh, in older age or maybe they had disabilities mm -hmm. with someone who would, the idea was um, they bring like a, a dish of some mm -hmm. food and then they have to stay and have a chat and mm -hmm. things like that. So I started working on that. And then I was working on the other projects like the composting scheme. They started mm -hmm. up a, a community kitchen. Mm -hmm. So they would like sell tickets for people to learn to do a cookery course like sushi or things like that. And then they would mm -hmm. use the money to fund people um, who couldn't afford things like that to come in and learn how to maybe just like make bread or making mm -hmm. um, like basic meals, but also they allowing them to also come and do like sushi courses and things like that. Mm -hmm. More interesting. So I was kind of, I ended up with a very hodgepodge role, mm -hmm. like fingers and lots of pies, mm -hmm. um, helping out with all these different projects, running a couple of them on my own and things. Oops, sorry. Nice. And um, so it was really interesting being involved because that was also, they were doing some policy making, mm -hmm. um, impacting on like uh, lots of local schools work mm -hmm. and obviously revolving around diet and health and how all these different barriers interact with each other and, and mm -hmm. create um, problems for a lot of families and people mm -hmm. in the community. So it ended up being like the best work experience for medical school. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was really nice that I actually, I got my, I was meant to start medicine in 2018. I deferred mm -hmm. a year so that I could work for them okay. for longer mm -hmm. because I just loved it so much. And I wanted to like, just expand my skills so much more and just see how much, mm -hmm. Um, I could get out of it and then and I was also having a little bit like oh god do I definitely want to do medicine because I really love this job mm -hmm. um, but decided in the end that I needed like the the science the aspect as well as the people stuff as well mm -hmm. yeah that sounds awesome some really good projects and is it something that you can continue to maybe volunteer with them or just be involved in some way while like throughout your degree yeah I've um, kept in touch with them and during covid they set up um a food hub so they were packaging all the kind of food parcels to go to people that were struggling to get food for mm -hmm. whatever reason um so i volunteered with them over last summer um and i've done like tiny little, little bits here and there mm -hmm. during my course as well it's just a bit harder so yeah. i like to keep touch and like see mm -hmm. what they're doing and yeah. occasionally like get like contact them and be like oh I really love this like oh can I do this little bit mm -hmm. <laughs> which is really nice and they're happy for me I assume to, to yeah. keep <laughs> interrupting yeah. and, and sort of being involved which is nice mm -hmm. <laughs> and like throughout that work what were the kind of the biggest challenges and such like was it getting money in or in kind of the befriending scheme was it getting people to kind of sign up to the scheme to be part of it like or did, it, did you actually just have lots of resources available? Like, how did you find it? Um, money, definitely. Yeah. Definitely not yeah. enough funding, just mm -hmm. in the whole sector. As I was joining, they had lost uh, a funding bid for mm -hmm. their, um, like, weight loss side of things. So they had a team of dietitians that used mm -hmm. to help people and do, like, six-week courses and things. And it wasn't mm -hmm. just, like, let's lose weight. It was, like, how to um, just not so much losing the weight but like making them feel happier and making just mm -hmm. making sure they're making like small but like healthier changes to their diet if that's what they wanted and things like that mm -hmm. um so funding was a constant battle I'm lucky enough that I didn't have to write the funding bids myself mm -hmm. but just hearing my colleagues having to do them I was like oh my god that sounds awful um and you know it meant that every year you kind of weren't really guaranteed all mm -hmm. the work so I dipped and changed from like full time to part time, like five days a week to four days a week to three days a week to up, like depending mm -hmm. on where we could get the funding from and then for what. So I'd be working on different projects based on what we'd got the funding for, mm -hmm. um, which is like that's nationwide. That mm -hmm. I, I think that that happens definitely in the whole of our region that was happening. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of it's very fluctuating like that. And it does require. Um, you have to be really passionate about it basically to have a whole career in it mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I was very lucky to be surrounded by all these women that were just like 
absolute like top-notch role models that you could mm-hmm. want which is the main thing but yeah definitely those challenges and then also for me personally because you're speaking to a lot of people from um very disadvantaged backgrounds mm-hmm. so I spoke to people that you know weren't sure how they were gonna um feed their children that evening I spoke mm-hmm. to people that had suffered abuse in the past mm-hmm. um so it's a lot of and sometimes all you can do is you there might not even be anything your service can do for them but they're struggling to get through health services they're struggling to get through social services Mm -hmm. and you end up kind of just like listening to them for an hour and um like they they sometimes they just want like want to talk to someone and you Mm -hmm. you happen to be there so it's like taking it all in and then having to take time after the call to like go and just like okay I just need to like debrief Mm -hmm. and like kind of let go of that as much as I can because they were somehow like there were there were plenty of conversations that made me cry afterwards just Mm because their situation was so wretched and you know and I try and help as much as we could and like getting food parcels or trying to um, nudge social services to go pay them a visit and things like this Mm -hmm. but you know sometimes it was just it was just hard sometimes Mm -hmm. and it wasn't even me living that life I I just had to listen to it for an hour so Mm -hmm. oh there is that like real gut-wrenching side of it as well Mm -hmm. and those sorts of things people might not necessarily automatically kind of assume goes with the role when you talk about you know not for profit and food and nutrition you kind of all these other aspects that go with it and the people that use those services it's not yeah people's natural thoughts and do they like for the training that you get training for that or training in kind of working with people and that side of things for the job I did actually um Mm -hmm. like a lot of the training I got was like from other staff members and like Mm -hmm. you know sort of informal training on that sense but they Mm -hmm. they were very keen to me to go on any train that I wanted so I went and did this course that was kind of um I can't remember what they called it it was basically like motivational interviewing techniques Mm -hmm. and like how to actively listen to people Mm -hmm. and you know see are they looking to make changes or are they just needing someone to kind of Mm -hmm. talk to about things and stuff like that so that was always really helpful um and yeah but it was mainly it was mainly like taking my lead from like my managers um and the people around me and kind of how like um how as organization we should be responding which was I love um Vic who is the director of the food partnership she was always like yeah if you've got the time to be able to put in and like just have a call with someone even if it's not necessarily building on our service that's just great because you can help that person and then people know that we're an organization that they can come to um so I really liked that side of things and it was a very supportive organization like I never uh felt like I had to like keep anything hidden or anything like that so it was a very open space um which I think is why like we all like gave so much of ourselves to it and we felt able to cope with those difficult conversations and things like that because we knew we could like chat to each other after over a cup of tea <laughs> yeah and I feel like uh like attitudes of a team like spread so if you have people that you know that's how they feel and that's what they encourage it then makes everyone else kind of work to those standards or able to act in that way um so it works really well that sounds like such a good experience for medicine like had you got into it assuming that or kind of expecting that or was it a bit of a surprise um I think I had some some assumptions that were Mm -hmm. proved right but the whole thing like there were just there was yeah it was definitely the best work experience there was Mm -hmm. so much more than just you know oh a family that can't afford food like there's you don't Mm -hmm. like the depth to that the fact that they can't afford food for the night is like the tip of the iceberg but then it's Mm -hmm. everything else like the mum's working three jobs Mm -hmm. or you know there's um social factors going on or they're really struggling with the income and like just so many different things Mm -hmm. um so it was definitely if, you know yeah. if we could get every medical student to go mm-hmm. and do a placement with an organization like that I think it would just open people's minds to the different kinds of barriers mm-hmm. that they might not recognize and it, it did it taught me so much and we do touch um in BSMS they are quite good they do touch on like health inequalities and things mm-hmm. like that um but again we only kind of touch on it and it's like mm-hmm. I've got 
I've always got so much to say in those sessions but I like mm -hmm. I don't want to like hog the conversation because I'm not the mm -hmm. only one with experience with these things and like mm -hmm. I'm like oh I just want to like keep talking about this <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah do you have like societies then that focus on those sorts of things that you could like spend more time talking about it or raising awareness sort of thing there is um mm -hmm. So one of the societies that I joined um, is our Homeless Medicine Society, mm -hmm. um, which obviously there are, with that as well, there are loads of different intersecting mm -hmm. inequalities going on there. And so that's been really great to kind of be involved and um, put on events for that, but also mm -hmm. on a personal level, like meeting mm -hmm. the people that are doing things, um, even if it's like local to Brighton, seeing what kind of guidelines there are and what support networks and how how that differs because when you're giving providing healthcare to homeless people it does work a lot different to how like kind of mainstream mm -hmm. access to healthcare works and there's a lot more outreach and things like that um so it's definitely built on that and yeah I think I think it must be the same in most medical schools I'm sure they have like mm -hmm. homeless medicine or like we have nutri tank as well which like the nutrition mm -hmm. one yep. and that touches on a lot of those issues as well which is mm -hmm. pretty good um yeah yeah it's gonna be good yeah perfect um and just taking a quick step back did you feel like you were able to convey your experience like in your application and in your interviews um because I know a lot of the like a lot of the application processes vary and how much they actually look at things like personal statements and how much is just on entrance exams and that sort of thing um so did you feel like you were really able to to get that across yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely mentioned it in my yeah. personal statement. Mm -hmm. BSMS are a bit different. They don't read the personal statements. They don't count that mm -hmm. towards the application. Um, but Imperial and UCL did. So whatever I said must yeah. have rang happy bells and ticked mm -hmm. their boxes. Um, definitely at all three interviews. You know, all every time, like, oh, example of communication or teamwork or resilience mm -hmm. or all of those different things. It's like, well, when I was working at the food yeah. partnership, <laughs> Yeah. So it just it yeah it because it just exemplified all of those values as well and it um yeah it, it kind of made it easier for me because I didn't feel like I was you know sometimes when you feel like you kind of have to twist a scenario to fit what they're trying to mm -hmm. ask whereas this time I was kind of like oh I'm gonna have to like really slim it down so I'm only tackling this like question that they're asking mm -hmm. so it's, you know everything's so much more complex than just mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah and were the interviews MMIs um, for all for, for all of them. No, only mm. BSMS was MMI. Okay. Um, the other two were panel interviews. So mm. for Imperial, it was a panel of I think it was four people, mm -hmm. and then UCL it was three people, including one person who I think was a head teacher for a local school. Okay. Um, and then an academic, and then a doctor, if mm -hmm. I remember rightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So quite quite mixed. Yeah, I was going to say for MMIs, you could use it for every station and no one would know that you were just using the same. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you can as long as you're answering the question, but um, just thinking of the setup. And were they were they all undergrads that you were applying for or were there any grad courses? Um, so BSMS and UCL, I think, were undergrad. Mm -hmm. Imperial, mm -hmm. it was it was uh, it wasn't like a, a four-year graduate it was a graduate course but I think it was still five years if I'm remembering rightly yeah because is their undergrad six years yeah 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 I was just thinking the when the one grad interview I had people a lot everyone else had lots of experience and we had to do a group um interview scenario and everyone was using their it seemed to come through a lot more whereas I think for the undergrad they don't expect you to you know have as much experience because it's mainly undergrads so I was wondering if there was less or more opportunity to share your experience depending on the type of interview it, it was um if you felt that at all um yeah I think I think for UCL that might have held true actually mm. um and also I I felt like their questioning was almost um, guiding you towards a, a slightly more clinical answer rather mm -hmm. than like a, a personalized one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still personal. People, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, for BSMS, I think that's one of their big things is they're like really into looking for like that well-rounded individual. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, like all those buzzwords like holistic care yeah all those yeah. things so and I know that they do accept they accept a lot of graduates they have mm-hmm. a lot of um so like the access to medicine course for mm-hmm. people that you know are coming from different careers and things like that um so I think they've made their with the MMIs it's it's a lot more open mm-hmm. to interpretation and, and you mm-hmm. can kind of draw upon whatever experiences you have then which mm-hmm. works if you're just fresh out of A levels you might not have tons but then if you are like you know there's people on a course that have done nursing before and things like that so then mm-hmm. they can talk about their experiences and it kind of leaves it open to that uh, which is quite nice I quite like that style of it yeah um and talking about the course now so is there a quite a high proportion of grads on the course do you feel yeah I'm I don't know how it compares to the rest of the country because it's hard to know but mm-hmm. I think I think we're between like 30 and 40 percent grads wow that's huge yeah I think I think Bristol it's roughly 10 percent I would say hmm. um so out of 280 270 I'd say yeah 20 to 25 um so 30 to 40s yeah huge yeah. maybe I'm slightly overestimate but it feels like there's a lot because um we have I think we have around 210 on our course for quite a small mm-hmm. course and then I know I think we got about a dozen people that are from the access course mm-hmm. um there's definitely there's quite a lot of people that feed it because it's two universities there's quite a lot of people that are fed in from doing mm-hmm. their biomedical biopechanical courses as well uh, so maybe we are a bit higher but maybe that's because we've got a smaller cohort um yeah it's quite a nice mix actually because I have friends who are grads and I have friends who are undergrads mm-hmm. um so it's nice to to mix <laughs> yeah and do you feel like everyone is quite integrated within the course from all the kind of different routes yeah I think so um yeah I like I think that's one of the things that I was worried about before I started and Mm -hmm. people who message me say that's what they're worried about like feeling out of place or like Mm -hmm. they don't fit in or they're too old Mm -hmm. and and things like that Mm -hmm. um I mean I started when I was 23 so I wasn't massively old but compared to if you're thinking about it you're starting at the same time as someone who's 18 years old Mm -hmm. fresh out of A levels Mm -hmm. um it it can seem like quite a big gap but actually when you get down to it um well for me at least it didn't really feel applicable like didn't Mm -hmm. really come up you know obviously you get the jokes like oh so I'm turning 25 this year yeah and so obviously like oh my god you're so old (laughs) like yes I am thank you Mm -hmm. um but yeah other than that it's it's never been a barrier to anything that I've experienced so I'm really happy about that Mm -hmm. yeah I think I've said before that when you're on the course talking about the course stuff no can't can't really tell difference at all you know everyone brings a lot to discussion um and then it's when you maybe talk about what you're going to do in the evening or (laughs) how late you're going to stay up that uh perhaps some differences uh show through a bit more um but yeah otherwise sometimes yeah you just don't really notice um a lot of the time um and do you feel like you get to share like you've come in with a lot of experience you said you get to talk about it in tutorials do you feel like people do get the chance to share their experiences and like help people learn from them as well within the course structure yeah I think so um yeah I'm I've become that person that is like the first to speak there's a there's a little group of us Mm -hmm. because mainly because in in my sense I'm like if I speak first it means then they're not going to pick on me later um Mm -hmm. so I but I think there is generally like a good it's obviously been restricted because everything's virtual makes it harder but we're still managing mm-hmm. to kind of like share our experiences and things like that mm-hmm. and even um one of the guys on our course who's a nurse like we had to um one of our clinical skills we had to like break the glass ampules and then like practice drawing yeah. up and stuff and mm-hmm. we had a um you know someone there teaching us but he was sat right next to me and like I was just like oh, I'm trying to like psych myself how to do it and he's like yeah. just do it you can do it you can do it just do it <laughs> I was like thank you I needed that reassurance yeah <laughs> so I think it's it's nice when you kind of see everyone's different experiences come into play mm-hmm. um but likewise like um I'm quite amazed at the experiences that the straight from A level people have had as well mm-hmm. you know just from their own life experience or just things that they've happened upon and things like that so mm-hmm. um yeah I kind of get the reverse thing where sometimes the 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 younger I don't want to say the younger people have the the school leaders 
mm-hmm. they're like oh you've done a degree you must know this you must know this I'm like no no I don't it's yeah. nine years since I finished my, my GCSEs like I don't know mm-hmm. anything anymore you will know it less mm-hmm. than me <laughs> yeah yeah um and just talking back to how the kind of course is quite like, holistic and looking at the social side do you do many creative assignments I know Bristol have a similar feel of we do quite a lot of the social science and um, but they also bring in quite a lot of creative projects and like art stuff I was wondering if that's similar for you um we do some so yeah we do like the student selected components okay yeah um so you kind of choose which one you Mm -hmm. do although sometimes you just get given a random one um but we do there are generally some creative ones on there so Mm -hmm. I know the options before there's been like cartoon making um, yeah there's been like a music therapy one Mm -hmm. um and then like more kind of philosophical ones as well where you just kind Mm -hmm. of debate different ethical conundrums and things like that which people have really enjoyed there was a a coding one last time which apparently was really Mm -hmm. difficult um Mm -hmm. but it was quite cool that that was an option um so yeah there I think they they do get bits of creativity in there I wouldn't say it's loads Mm -hmm. um but it is a bit which is nice yeah yeah I was just thinking it sounds probably the most similar course to Bristol that I've heard someone talk about um and it was something I was not expecting when I started um we had to like write haikus um and do like an art assignment um like not just by student choice you know but um, people were doing drawings and poems and um yeah it was actually really I was surprised at I think once you to just you know, commit to it and say like oh, actually you know get into this and I was really surprised actually at, at the value it brought and the reflection on communicating through different mediums and that sort of thing so um yeah it sounded more similar to you, the elements of your course as well um so thinking a bit outside the course so we've talked a bit about societies um any other hobbies or what do you like to do outside of medicine uh god I think everyone <laughs> hobby is Netflix now isn't it <laughs> okay okay maybe pandemic like um, not new, yeah if the pandemic yeah. wasn't happening <laughs> so yeah I'm part of the homeless medicine society mm-hmm. I'm also in um it's the oncology hematology and palliative care society very okay, long yeah. we, we just call it OHP it's mm-hmm. um and I've been with them I've been doing this kind of um how to get into research series which is like nice, okay. things broken out on a simple level like mm-hmm. so just you know how to read a scientific paper like how do you read mm-hmm. all that text and interpret it and things like that which I really enjoy um other than that I see I really like walking and mm-hmm. hiking so we do that mm-hmm. quite a bit and just go on long rambly walks around the countryside mm-hmm. like we're retired <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah I you know what I really love reading but when you I think that's the thing with university like your enjoyment reading gets replaced by like oh this is intellectually stimulating I should read this mm-hmm. so I'm trying to like reintroduce more like sci-fi and like I'm rereading yeah. the Harry Potters recently as well so nice. like yeah. recapture like mm-hmm. a bit as well which is nice um so I've been enjoying that other than that I think it's kind of yeah I mean other than that now that the pubs are open it's like pub yeah yeah <laughs> we could nice walk hobby. Yeah, you can walk exactly. and then go to pop. And then uh, is it is there quite a lot of open areas around um, where you are? Yeah, there's... Um, so I don't know how much you know about Brighton, but it's kind mm-hmm. of the main road through Brighton is Lewis Road. And it's kind of, there's like a set in a valley. So it's like hills either side. Mm-hmm. Um, we live up the side of one of the hills. So we like, just if you just go to the top of our hill, and then you can see the whole of Brighton. It's really beautiful. And then you can mm-hmm. carry on walking around, and like, and you're immediately like in the South Downs, basically, mm-hmm. which is all really nice. Um, and then everywhere's kind of got open spaces now as well, which is nice. Mm-hmm. So it's a kind of I like Brighton. It's a small city, so you mm-hmm. kind of get that city feel, and you get quick buses. Um, mm-hmm. Quick for me, not quick for London. Uh, mm-hmm. I keep being reminded. And yeah. um, but you also get like all the nature and we've got loads of parks in Brighton as well which is really nice Mm. yeah is it somewhere you can see yourself staying for like the long term or do you want to mix it up and try somewhere else going into the future 
I because I've been here for I think I've been here close to six years now Mm -hmm. so I'm kind of at the end of my degree I'm a bit like I want to go live somewhere else just like Mm -hmm. see what it's like living in another city even if I Mm -hmm. don't like it um, yeah. just to try something different so I mean I'd love to live in Edinburgh for a year mm-hmm. because uh, we go on there sometimes for holiday like pre-pandemic and mm-hmm. it's so beautiful mm-hmm. um, even when it's absolutely pouring it down with rain mm-hmm. it's just such a nice place to be so I think that would be ideal but yeah definitely want to mm-hmm. kind of move around and try some different areas yeah I had a uh, a macaroni cheese pie in Edinburgh and uh, who would think that it's genius it's absolute genius a macaroni and cheese pie um inspired so yeah I can highly recommend if you if you do move there thinking about kind of future thinking about specialities so you mentioned kind of pathology and then um moving on uh, to like nutrition that's the thing are these things that you can see in your future specialities or you said the oncology and hematology society um are those areas to investigate or are you not too sure um yeah I'm still completely like I don't know I don't know yeah um yeah. I don't know every time I get exposed to a new speciality I'm like oh maybe I can see myself doing that mm-hmm. so we do quite a few like GP things so and then I was starting to think oh maybe maybe I want to be a GP which I'm sure mm-hmm. is a clever ploy by the medical school to get us yeah. all to be GP mm-hmm. um but then my most <laughs> um my most recent one I had a really lovely GP she was so lovely but she basically said if you want to have kids just be a GP don't do anything else just be a GP and mm-hmm. I was like oh I want to have kids but like weirdly I was like no I want to like yeah. rebel against that yeah. and try and be a hospital doctor with kids so mm-hmm. um that which is <laughs> not the right way to choose your special but mm-hmm. um so I'm just I'm just completely I mean yeah I'm hoping once we start moving into the wards and things like that I'll get a clear idea of what it's like to actually be working in different mm-hmm. specialities and hopefully gain some idea but as yeah. yet completely undecided yeah it's a nice place to be open opportunities exactly. um and as part of your work with the society is research something you would like to be part of your future career is it something you'd like to combine with clinical practice I think so Mm uh it's really funny after I finished my degree and like going through the whole dissertation thing I was like Mm -hmm. never again I'm never putting myself through that and then I I keep saying yes to things so I'm doing a desk Mm -hmm. review at the moment um which is nice because it's not lab work Mm -hmm. um and I'm kind of enjoying that and I like I think I just like that uh what is that um jack of all trades master of none kind yeah. of thing yeah. so mm-hmm. and I think being completely undecided that helps me do that as well so I don't feel tied to a spe- specific area so I mm-hmm. like I think I like the research stuff more because um it sounds I think a lot of people are put off because it sounds really intimidating like oh god how would you even get started mm-hmm. and I'm just like we'll just send an email yeah <laughs> yeah I was having this conversation yeah. last night with a friend she's like oh I just, mm-hmm. yeah but I don't really know oh I don't know and I'm just when you get home tonight just write the email and send it like the worst mm-hmm. thing is they're going to say no sorry um I think it's a lot so I think it's more I like getting other people to go into research yeah, rather than okay. me doing it myself <laughs> yeah but I think there's a really big gap because yeah like you said it is intimidating and often it's done by connection and making those emails and making those contacts and then things snowball from from there so finding that um first person but yeah if you've got an interest send off an email show some genuine interest of why you're interested not just hello please can I have some research um but yeah I it got me I moved from Leeds to Bristol because of an email I sent on a project Ooh. so it, it does it really does work um people love their research and uh really happy to talk about it and get you involved when they can so yeah it's good really good advice um talking of advice any top tips so coming out of your last your first couple of years of medicine um for anyone starting or you know anything you've learned now going into future years what would your top tips be um I think one of my top tips is to schedule in fun things to do okay yeah um because I'm I think everyone's realized this year that uh our mental health and well-being have to take a priority Mm -hmm. and so I like this kind of there's a kind of movement I'm seeing where people are seeing medicine not as like a lifestyle but Mm -hmm. just a job 
Um, there's advantages of that where you kind of give yourself a break and you can take time away and things like that. So I definitely believe like when you're scheduling, oh, I need to do these lectures and I've got to get uh, this part of my essay done. Um, also having in like, OK, and I'm going to go and meet this friend and do this mm -hmm. thing or um, I want to watch this film, like something like that, which I really um, I've started doing. And that's been quite helpful. Um, and then. I would say try to oh how's the best way to phrase this <laughs> it's kind of it's learning to be okay with failing mm -hmm. not, not like not being careless and not mm -hmm. trying anything um but I really liked it at the beginning of our degree and they we had introduction talks and a, a big theme was you're probably all coming from being like the top in your year mm -hmm. or like those you know top mm -hmm. students where everyone's always giving you praise and you're always getting mm -hmm. a stars or whatever things like that you're coming into a group a big group of people who are all the same so naturally mm -hmm. it's going to filter out some people are going to be at the top but some people are going to be at the bottom and that's not necessarily a bad thing you're all going to be mm -hmm. doctors at the end of it we hope mm -hmm. um and it's kind of being okay with kind of averaging out mm -hmm. um which i i took whole like completely to heart and I was like cool I'm just going to focus on passing or like getting the average grade rather than mm -hmm. trying to be the person to get the best because in my head I'm like I could go from like a 70% to an 80% but what would I be sacrificing mm -hmm. in my life to get there and mm -hmm. is it actually worth it if we're all getting the same grades at the end anyway mm -hmm. um so yeah kind of find find a way to be okay with mm -hmm. just being okay I think mm -hmm. <laughs> very vague advice but I hope that's helpful <laughs> right. yeah I think they're two quite big important things I think with the kind of scheduling in fun time how do you get past there enjoying the fun time and not thinking about all the things you're not doing because you're not doing them that's something I you know I, you know I will sit here and you know enjoy this thing but you're thinking about other things how do you get past that um I think if that's really ingrained in you, it's really hard to get over that. And I can, mm -hmm. yeah, I understand. I've been there myself. Mm -hmm. um, for me, there's like little things. So if I schedule something in the evening, mm -hmm. it kind of pressures me like, oh God, I've got to get stuff done today mm -hmm. because I'm going out later, so I won't have a chance. And I found mm -hmm. that helps. Like if I just have a day completely free, I end up mm -hmm. wasting it because I think I'll mm -hmm. do it later, I'll do it later. And then the mm -hmm. day's gone. Um, so I think that can help because then you've kind of, you're pressuring yourself to do a little bit of work and then you kind of feel like oh I've, I deserve this mm -hmm. or this yeah or whatever I'm doing mm -hmm. um and I think learning to recognize when that's when doing the fun thing is going to be more helpful mm -hmm. than studying yeah um if you know if you feel like you've been working all day and you're really stressed out you don't feel like you're making as much as much progress as you want mm -hmm. actually the best thing you can probably do is go take yourself off and do something completely mm -hmm. different whether that's walking pubbing you know just doing something mm -hmm. and then coming back to it fresh tomorrow mm -hmm. so I think those are two things that you can do um to kind of mitigate it a little bit mm -hmm. um yeah I think you know with all these things there's I don't think there's any hard and fast rule and obviously everyone's different mm -hmm. and if you're prone to be quite anxious and stressful as quite mm -hmm. a lot of us are mm -hmm. uh, that will obviously take a lot more work than some people so yeah. managing your own expectations yeah and do you, people talk about med school being a really competitive environment do you think those things are harder to do in medicine when there's perhaps the image that everyone's always working and always you know learning the new things and, and like know all the content or do you find that actually you can kind of be able to just I suppose do you and not be pressured by that um it's interesting talking about competitiveness I mm -hmm. since I think applying for medical school and if you know other people applying mm -hmm. for medical schools I definitely felt like a very competitive edge mm -hmm. once I was in mm -hmm. I that lessened like quite dramatically mm -hmm. um I think it's still there but to a much lesser degree I don't feel as much I'm competing against my peers because the medical school need to get us all through to get their money's worth basically mm -hmm. how I kind of try and see it <laughs> yeah um but you you know I think it's it's very interesting like you 
if you can recognize that there are people that you're talking to that make you feel more stressed after talking mm -hmm. to them as nice yeah. as they are it might be that you just have to not talk to them as much as you, mm -hmm. as you would like to or kind of make it so that you only talk about social things and things like mm -hmm. that and um i think when you start opening up about how behind you are mm -hmm. people are very quickly to be like, yes me too yeah um mm -hmm. and i find it i think that's a, a happy coincidence i found when i started doing like mm -hmm. instagram and stuff like oh even just the other day i put something on there like oh i did it in my module tutorial yesterday i got a bunch mm -hmm. of answers wrong and i had i think i had um three people message me and be like oh thank you for saying that because yeah, yeah. this happens to me <laughs> a mm -hmm. lot mm -hmm. and it's like oh i kind of like that as soon as you open up and someone says it mm -hmm. everyone seems to follow suit and you kind of realize that people are not always doing as well as you might think they are mm -hmm. um or even if they are it doesn't matter so much because mm -hmm. they're doing their thing and you're just doing your thing mm -hmm. um same for like if you're struggling like mental health wise as well uh mm -hmm. like if i say i've been struggling a lot recently and if i you know i know whichever friends i send that to about half or more are going to come back like oh yeah me too mm -hmm. and then we can talk about it so I think the competitiveness um kind of is limited in my life at the moment mm -hmm. which is quite nice and I don't know yeah. if that's the way to do it or if that's just a happy coincidence that that's just happened mm -hmm. and do you think did it actually take uh, quite a lot of confidence or courage to start being open about that you know if you kind of you're the first to say it and then everyone agrees obviously once people agree that's you know makes it a lot easier but being the first to say that if you didn't see other people saying it was that something that was quite hard to do definitely yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely um especially if you are used to like being the high achiever mm -hmm. or if you're used to being um the kid in the family that is doing okay mm -hmm. um is another one that i'm affected yeah. with um, as soon as you 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 kind of you've built this thing in your head where you have to be okay you have to be on top of it all the time mm -hmm. um so admitting that you're not feels like you're you're somehow failing mm -hmm. or you know you're it's breaking some kind of taboo mm -hmm. um and i i don't have any advice for how to get over that at all no. like I think one day I just had enough and I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. really bad at this. I really struggle mm -hmm. with that. Blah, blah. And um, I promise you, once you do, you'll have people saying, mm -hmm. oh my God, me too. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because me too. And I just didn't mm -hmm. want to say it to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so it is quite a big thing to do. And if you can find friends that, are, that, that do speak like that in a very honest mm -hmm. way, um, then yeah, hold on to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I always try and think I would love someone to be able to come to me about it. But for that, I have to, you know, I suppose do exhibit that same behavior. So if I would want to imagine I was someone people could talk to things about, I need to talk about things in the first place. So I suppose, yeah, if I, yeah, you have to kind of set the standard, I suppose, or set the environment you want to create. So, um, but yeah, not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, but it's nice to see especially talking about instagram it is really nice and helpful to see people out there doing it um because it makes makes it okay you know the more it happens the the more it makes it okay um and like you said it's a common theme between a lot of people um so um thank you so much for all your time today i've taken up a lot of it everywhere um are you you know you're on instagram people can find you there they can follow your story and um, about to go into clinical year so we might see some more some more placement um so i'll put your details below so people can um can find them and can follow you there um but thank you so much for your time today and your insights uh, it's been really interesting and great to talk to you thank you thank you so much for having me this has been so much fun i like yeah. like this. this is great. yeah um yeah it's good i think for current students you know and you know it's good for everyone and people thinking about doing medicine from a different background it's great to see the variety of people that do it and then people that are in it it's nice to see that i suppose yeah you're represented or you know people uh resonate with different parts of people's stories don't they so yeah it's really good mm. yeah definitely yeah thank you very much <laughs>